Yeah. So uh, as a uh, first talk, uh, we have a uh, Carlo uh, Danieli, and uh, he will be uh, talking about fine tuning localization in interacting flat band networks. So please welcome the speaker. Thank you, thank you. So, okay, let's start. So thank you. Thank you for having me here. And thank you for the introduction. And I'm very happy to begin with the, to start this session, to start the session of the last day of this uh, workshop, which so far has been very entertaining and I, it seems people really enjoyed it. So I'd like to start with, a, no, uh, okay, very well. So these are the people with whom I worked. So uh, essentially it's Alexei who initiated this whole thing then uh, with Sergey, Igor, and then there's Mitun who now is in the, in the US. Okay, so I'd like to begin with uh, unfolding the title. Uh, as you see, well, you probably are familiar with every single word, but the one that I would like to emphasize a little bit is this uh, concept of fine tuning. Again, familiar word, which by following Wikipedia is the process in which parameters of a model are adjusted so very precisely according to Wikipedia in order to obtain certain phenomena or fit with certain observations. So, and essentially this is what we, we do because uh, we study interacting flat bands. So we take uh, flat bands, so we add interaction and then uh, we, we essentially don't really focus on specific uh, flat band systems. We just take a class of them and then we start to tune parameters in order to see whether we can obtain certain phenomena or not. This is essentially in a very broad sense what we do. So, uh, basically now an introductory slide, which uh, by now has become quite obsolete because we have seen these figures uh, rather often. <laughs> but just to set the language, uh, essentially we're dealing with a flat band network. I will focus on one dimensional case, but uh, all I will say that can be generalized to higher dimension. And uh, just to keep uh, the language uh, basically, if I look at uh, uh, an eigenvalue problem of a tight bending model, you can imagine any of these sample uh, shown down here. Uh, the core um, names that you have to keep in mind is this matrix H0, this matrix H1, and then nu. Because these matrices H0 and H1 are the matrices that define uh, in this language the uh, unit cell profile. So this is a uh, Unit cell that define the profile, for instance, of this diamond chain. Then there is the uh, matrix H1, which defines the uh, interaction, the hopping between nearest neighbor uh, uh, unit cells, and uh, the vector psi, which is basically a vector that represents the unit cell itself. And nu is the parameter that describes the dimension of this vector or the rank of these two matrices, these two square matrices, and essentially counts the number of sites per unit cell or equivalently the number of spectral bands. Now, with that said, uh, no new information here, just language. And therefore, uh, let's move on with what we do, which feels, uh, fits uh, pretty loosely in the, in the mentality of perturbing flat bands. So taking a problem that we have just seen and then add what is here colored in red. There's a very generic term uh, which can be called perturbation, which can be some disorder term or can be some driving or some non-admission terms or whatever else in our, in our, uh, in our talk will be interaction. Now, what uh, typically you expect is that when you add such term, uh, you lose uh, compact uh, localized states. Sometimes you lose even the entire band structure because for instance, you add this order and then the system uh, does not allow uh, for block solution anymore. And then uh, you essentially check what happens. This is, uh, this is a scheme of study that we have heard uh, several times over this, uh, this uh, workshop. Now, uh, our approach is essentially to don't, as I said, to don't focus on a specific lattice, but try to sort of be somewhat general in the choice of these matrices H0 and H1 and then start to apply this idea of fine tuning for certain given perturbation or certain given interaction in our case. Now, in order to substantiate what I just said, I would like to take you to a tiny detour, which I think is worth it towards uh, to unfold this idea of uh, fine tuning. And uh, this detour goes through the nice world of uh, generating flatland. 
Now, generating flatland is a business that has been around since the early days of uh, flatland physics. And uh, because essentially, if you look, for instance, at this uh, tie bending network, and you, and you toss randomly your matrix H0 and H1, you're gonna get some form of a dispersion and all the eigenstates are extended and therefore you don't have a flat band. So in order to get a flat band, you need to work uh, what these two matrices are. And uh, you can do it uh, systematically to generate as many flat bands as possible, or you can do it more specifically and you wanna tailor some specific subclasses of flat bands. Now, here is a very small, almost a ridiculously small uh, recap of some methods. Some dates back to the early days of flat bands. Some are uh, more recent. Uh, some, for instance, this one we heard uh, the other day by Malte. And, and uh, if you want a more uh, extensive recap, you can see this review down, the, down here. Now, I would like to spend a few words uh, to say very briefly, wait. Uh, this work done by Alexia, Sergey, and in particular Ibrahim a couple of years ago, where they wanted to generate flat bands in 1D, starting again from this uh, nearest neighbor, uh, nearest neighbor eigenvalue problem. And the approach they used was essentially to uh, enforce the existence of a compact localized state with a certain size. So essentially to say, good. Now I say that uh, these are my inputs, so a certain number of vectors, psi one, psi two, until psi u, where u is uh, another variable that you can choose. And then you essentially you work yourself backward with the matrices H0 and H1. Now, if you do that, you have to sweat a little bit, but uh, you essentially can, uh, can arrive to very powerful results. For instance, let me unfold what happens when you take a simple case, so two band problem. And then you fit uh, u equal to so essentially the unit uh, the compact localized state occupies two unit cells so uh, they occupy two unit cells so nearest neighbor CLSs overlap this overlap generates some uh, non orthogonality between nearest neighbor CLSs and therefore you don't you cannot really work easily with symmetries and uh, this is where this approach arrived I believe so uh, now your uh, input your vectors here are your inputs which are parameterized here as a normalized vector so you have some free parameter an angle here pi another angle here theta and then you have some uh, phases oops some phases which are i would say for the sake of this presentation not super relevant let's just focus on these two angles if you now put them in into this uh, eigenvalue problem and you want to work yourself Backward to the matrices that support such solution as compact localized state. It turns out that uh, here is the phase diagram, which is angle number one, theta, from zero to pi, angle number two, phi, from zero to pi. If you are in these white spots, well, so in this combination of this pair of angle, you find nothing. If you are into these colorful spots, yes, you find something. You find flat band, which corresponds to the energy, the flat band energies uh, here located in the color code. The matrices correspondent are this one. So H0 is pretty trivial. So we don't really focus on it. We just focus briefly on this matrix, which depends on the two angles. And once you choose a pair of angles, you get your matrix H1. And uh, for free, you get also the profile of the compact localized state. Now, further details of this work can be found in this paper right here. Or if you are interested, uh, there are, there's here a list of paper where they generalize this method to a higher dimension or even to um, non-admission case, or simply you can reach to Alexei, which I'm sure he will be happy to speak about. Now, all this, I'm saying all this because uh, this essentially is a nice way to see this uh, layering of fine tuning that uh, flat band systems allow to. Because essentially, as I said, if you take a system, any, any system where you toss randomly these matrices, you get uh, some dispersion. Now, uh, among all this uh, cloud of systems, you can find uh, flat bands, but these flat bands, what, for instance, this example tells you that these flat bands exist in families. Now you can parameterize this matrix with all these angles and phases, and you don't get isolated points, you get entire manifolds of it. And in particular, what in these manifolds, just even in this simple one, you can trace sub manifolds. Like if, for instance, you do trivially fix some uh, angles to be like pi over four or pi over three, or you start to, for instance, ensure that you choose a mutually 
some angles, like for instance, you follow these curves that are drawn over here, and you can find the specific lattices, which for instance, have a specific properties of the CLS. So for instance, they all have the same amplitude and just different phases, or uh, the hopping have some specific uh, relation between each other and so on. So this is just, you see, in a free step, you can layer up some fine tuning. You go from no flat band to some flat band to some flat band with, with properties. So now let's move on into the interacting case with uh, this knowledge. And essentially we focused on the, both in the impact of nonlinearity and the impact of in the quantum interaction. We began with the nonlinearity and in particular a case uh, that attracted our attention was the case of all band flat. So uh, if you neglect this red colored part for just 10 seconds, we, we choose a tight bending model now here written as a time dependent equation where there is no uh, single particle dispersion. And then uh, if you add the nonlinearity, uh, then uh, we wanted to see what happens. There were also, when we started in 2019, there were also these two papers that are sort of parent because they came out uh, essentially almost at the same time. One of these, uh, the first one is by Sandra Maluchkov and uh, Daniel, which uh, we heard yesterday. And they were studying and among all the results this, uh, contained in this paper, they were showing that uh, uh, in this case right here, in this diamond ladder, uh, once uh, you apply this uh, magnetic field that at some fine tuned value of the flux, so you basically kill all dispersion and you get free band flat, free flat bands. And if you tune no linearity over there, some uh, on-site kernel linearity, you essentially kill all transport. So uh, no linearity is not gonna uh, ignite transport. So this is where we kicked in. But additionally to that, uh, we kicked in uh, together with an intuition by Alexei. And the intuition, which over time became a formal result, uh, even a formal theorem, is that uh, now here I present using this cartoonish representation of, uh, of the simplest case we could think like this uh, two band problem, but uh, Alexei's result uh, span over uh, all possible all band flat case in one dimension. And perhaps Alexei is also working on higher dimensional cases by now. Uh, but uh, what, uh, comes out from this result by Alexei is that uh, if you take uh, this uh, two band problem, all band flat, now you see all this uh, cross looking hopping, but uh, this is a bit of a facade in sense that you can apply local unitary transformation. So a transformation on this, uh, like this two by two matrix where uh, Z1 and W1 are two complex numbers uh, that respect a very known relation that if you apply it uh, within one unit cell and then you repeat it in the neighboring unit cell and then in the neighboring unit cell, uh, this is essentially, uh, this operation is going to simplify the lattice very much. It's going to throw away almost all the hopping up to this uh, missing one. And uh, essentially your uh, cross looking lattice is now become a set of disconnected dimers. Now you can go down the road and essentially fully disconnect also throw, throwing away this addition, this remaining hopping, but this is, I would say, useful for some technical reason, but the important step is this one, that you can take almost all your hopping and disconnect the system in dimers. Or if you have a more complex uh, set of, uh, if you have a more complex network into some disconnected islands. And what this uh, shows you is that, uh, basically this is another way to see the caging. In other words, that if you say you excite a compact excitation, so simply, uh, a single site excitation or just a finite number of sites and then you let the system evolve in time, this compact excitation is not gonna spread throughout the entire system. And this is uh, the way to see it from here is because when you do say a single site excitation, you just are exciting two neighboring dimers, but then uh, the propagation does not leak through. This is uh, just a visual representation of our already known result, the caging, but uh, this one also gives you this generator scheme because if you start from here, from a fully detangled uh, representation, so now basically you just fix uh, your flat band, say you fix uh, one flat band at one and the other one at minus one, not really so relevant, and then you work backward your transformations. Now you arrive no longer with just uh, an example, say for instance, the Kreutz, but you arrive with, uh, with an entire manifold of uh, all band flat lattices, because now you have the freedom of choice of uh, these uh, two complex numbers, Z2 and W2, and Z1 and W1. So you can essentially generate at will 
um, all band flat lattices. And this scheme can be applied in any uh, number of bands. Now, uh, we have heard uh, from Dylan this scheme because, and the reason why we like this scheme is because it allows you to deal with uh, perturbations. In our case, uh, is interaction. So we, be oops. we began with uh, nonlinearity, which is now here represented by these uh, red circles or here written in its Hamiltonian form. So this psi n, n counts the number of unit cells. i is the one that counts, that counts uh, i equal one, so upper side i equal to lower side. And essentially, if you follow this detangling process for this local nonlinearity, what is local originally becomes non-local with the steps. In particular, you arrive at the last step where the nonlinearity has now become a sort of a uh, nonlinear network. So the, all these uh, red lines are basically uh, no local nonlinear term that connects what used to be disentangled uh, in the linear in the linear case. And uh, this network is a very awful crocodile where the parameters here depends on your rotation angles z2, w2, and z1 and w1. And uh, if you start to look at these terms, uh, well, you basically are going to find out that these terms are what ignite transport. So in general, the result by this, uh, by this transformation is that uh, nonlinearity in general ignite transport in this old band flat, because uh, you don't have to look at this crocodile. You can just look at this uh, simple picture. So what used to be localized in single dimers, now this nonlinearity is allowed to bridge, allows to bridge these detangled dimers. And therefore, you're going to have transport. You're going to have transport un unless here you kill the terms that ignite transport. And you can do it by doing this fine tuning scheme that I was mentioning earlier on. In other words, if here this transformation is applied under the condition that absolute value z1 squared is equal to absolute value of w1 squared, then uh, all the terms that are igniting transport here or equivalently down here, uh, they are absent. And therefore, you can fine tune the uh, killing of, of transport. And uh, an example of it is uh, these two cases. One is the Kreuzleder, obtained by these two uh, by these two numbers, which fit the fine tuning condition. And this is another example obtained by another couple of numbers, which obviously does not fit this fine tuning condition. Here, this is just a sample. So basically, we are exciting a compact excitation. We excite uh, some neighboring site. I, if I remember correctly, we excite uh, three neighboring unit cells. And then we let the system go in time. So here we go. Uh, this is time. This is number of unit cells. And we plot in the color code, we plot this local density uh, written down here. And we see that uh, for a compact excitation in this fine tune case, the localization is well retained. Here, there are no tails. There is just uh, a compact excitation that remains compact over time. While in this non fine tuned case, this compact, the very same compact excitation broads and leaks out. Now, this is just a visual. If you want to be a little bit more systematic, you can look at uh, the time evolution of the second moment of these wave packets. And in this fine tuned case, the time, the second moment is just, st just sticks down here. So essentially, it sticks uh, the value somewhere between one and two and it doesn't grow. While in this uh, non-fine-tuned case, we see that it grows. This is for some uh, nonlinear strength uh, pretty small, and then we start to increase it uh, and see that uh, basically this second moment grows. It seemed to ignite some kind of a sub-diffusion uh, and all the uh, nonlinear strength, and for all the nonlinear strength we analyzed, uh, we see always this exponent, one half. Uh, we have no explanation. Why is this one half? Um, but uh, we didn't go into further into this direction. But at least uh, this is a result that probably is worth mentioning. Now, I'm sorry, but uh, yes. I think Rudolf Roma has a question. Oh, please. Yeah. Yes, Carlo, how fine is your fine tuning? So, um, how, how stable is, uh, is the, you know, is there a basin of attraction? Ah, so if you mean if I sort of add some small numbers here, uh, yeah, well, square root of two is hard to achieve, you know. In, yeah, in yeah. so yeah, I think it's pretty unstable. I mean, as long as you detune even uh, mildly, you are going to you are going to enter. So probably you are igniting some very uh, weak terms, 
of that is, but uh, transport is going to be ignited. Um, now, fair question, we, 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 we consider the quite a strong valuation of this fine tuning. Uh, no, I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> I would say you're going to break it and uh, transport will be there. Now, whether you're going to see the, this very exact uh, uh, behavior or not, this is something that we haven't checked. But probably in any finite system, going just a bit away from square root of two yeah. will not immediately leave, leave sort of this, this regime, right? I mean, well, I expect, system, I, okay. expect some, uh, I expect that as soon as you violate it, uh, even mildly, you are going to allow terms that are going to bridge these disentangled dimers and therefore transport is possible. That's, that's for sure. Even with the smallest perturbation of this, uh, of this fine tuning condition. So transport is- If, if people are already asking questions, uh, your uh, fine tuning is mathematically nice, but then you end up with the Hamiltonian. Yes. Uh, and the question is, can you, uh, propose physical situations in which you will get that Hamiltonian. Uh, yes, this is just a sample case, and uh, the Kreuzleiter has also been realized by, as a matter of fact. But uh, another system that uh, I'm not talking about here, but uh, is uh, this guy. This is also one that fits into this fine tuning condition. It's just that for free bands. So this is this has been realized uh, experimentally. No, but, but my question is, the fine tuning is yes. that. Can that be achieved by tuning some physical variable like yes, uh, like for, field, whatever? Yes, uh, both the Kreuzleiter or this uh, Aronoff bone cages has been achieved by fine tuning magnetic field over a diamond, over a rhombic lattice, or over this uh, uh, cross stitch lattice. So, it, some models, for instance, the Kreuz, can be fine tuned by using. Uh, magnetic field. So yes. Okay. Now, and, uh, no, another one. Yeah, Dario Rosa, please. Yeah, sorry. Hopefully, it will be oh. a, a quick question. Um, the fact that you don't have transport for that particular fine fine tune value does it mean that there are another uh, set of let's say local unitary transformation that detangle everything or not, or is it a different thing? Uh, I'm not sure I understood. So, uh, right. I mean, you said that if you take that particular fine tune of the interaction, there is no transport. Yes. Does that mean that you could find uh, unitary transformations that make again the dimers or not? Well, they do make the dimers. Uh, yes. Uh, no, I, I think we should postpone this uh, to the to the afterward discussion because I'm not sure really that uh, I will answer what uh, you are asking. And okay, so okay, yeah, yeah. Let's so let's let's shall, yeah, shall yeah, yeah. Let's talk to, to later because I yeah, I yeah, yeah. Seven sure. minutes and I'm halfway. Sure, there. sure. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, because uh, what I wanted to to say is that uh, basically, yeah, this was all nice, but uh, one of the things that we wanted to go for it was uh, essentially to. To replace this interaction, this nonlinear interaction, and go to uh, interacting particles, in particular because there were a couple of papers that attracted our, our attention. One, one of which was this one, which was taking this uh, Aronoff bone uh, cage free band problem and showed that for two interacting particles, there are extended states, and then uh, that this similar system or the Kreutz uh, allows for this number parity operators. So basically, operators that, uh, that tell you that particles can travel as long as they are paired together. Now, uh, so we began with the same system, just looking at the two interacting particles, which are initially located in the same unit cell. And again, same underlying profile, the fine-tuned, the non-fine-tuned, with two particles beginning in the same unit cell. In the non-fine-tuned, you see that here we show now the time evolution of the PDF of the probability of the particle density and this uh, you see some uh, ballistic transport and completely breakdown of the initial localization. While in this first case, this fine tune, you see again ballistic transport, but also some funny and uh, curious uh, strong excitation that remains from where you started. And uh, this attracted our attention. And therefore, uh, we, we started to think what it is and what, what, what this thing is. 
And uh, essentially, again, this transformation uh, is what tells us, uh, this is one way to interpret this result, because if, you, if now here you look at the Hubbard interaction and then you map it, that just stop here. Uh, this Hubbard interaction will, uh, will essentially result here in a plethora of terms, but uh, the relevant one that I would like to, to emphasize is this term plus its emission conjugate, which is a term that essentially kill two part, kills two particles here and uh, recreates two particles there. So this is the term that uh, allows uh, particles to travel in pair. While when you uh, don't not fine tune, now here I skip the prefactor for sake of space, but uh, you get uh, additional terms. One of which is this one, which is essentially what uh, goes by the name of uh, uh, density assisted hopping. So basically it allows one particle to jump from here to there, uh, granted that there is an additional particle sitting here. So this is the density term here. And then this is the other term that is moving. This is a hopping term that is moving from dimer to dimer. So essentially the, the finding uh, here represented for this two band problem, but can apply for all band problem in 1D is that yes, uh, for this fine-tuned uh, old band flat with Hubbard interaction, uh, bosons in this case, uh, they can travel as long as they are paired. So there is no exact quantum caging. Uh, this fine-tuning condition grants the existence of this parity, type, parity number operators. So that grants that the particle travel uh, coherently in pairs, generalizing this, uh, this work here in, from 2018. And in particular, it, it shows that there are uh, uh, some funny states, <laughs> which essentially uh, follows from this, uh, this transport, this paired transport. Because if you, if you put an unpaired single particle in one of these dimers, and then you put uh, an unpaired particle in the neighboring dimer, these two particles can interact for, with some terms that are not reported here for sake of space. But this term does not apply because uh, you need two particles to be in this timer in order to allow to this uh, pair to jump. So essentially, uh, in this uh, picture of uh, two particle problems that we started from, if you, there exists some exact eigenstates that are located when one particle is sitting here alone, another particle is sitting here alone. They do interact, but they do not travel. Therefore, you have a two particle compact state, two interacting particle compact state. Now, this scheme can be repeated iteratively, for instance, with three particles. If you, uh, if you allow a third particle to be here, so particle one here, one here, one here, you have a three particle compact localized states. And then further on, a fourth, fifth, sixth particle, this is uh, iteratively, you can go on uh, with any finite number of particles as you wish. So essentially, you can construct uh, in this fine tuned cases. Uh, what uh, we can call like uh, energy renormalized uh, interacting particle compact states. Now, aligning with this paper by Giuseppe, which is going to speak after me, and uh, this paper that was mentioned also yesterday by Daniel by Kuno, uh, can these states go by the name of quantum many body scars? So, well, this is a good question mark because I'm not really sure about that. But uh, yeah, I think uh, it was funny to mention about these states because these are compact localized states of, for instance, two particles. And once uh, you, you put two particles in the same unit cell, you're going to excite them. And then this is the effect that you're going to see. So your dynamic consists both in ballistic propagation as well as some strong localization that remains over time. Now, uh, this essentially didn't answer our positively to our question because we were looking for ways to actually kill transport of interacting particles. So the question still remained to us, can we sort of fine tune the possibility of kill completely charge transport in this all band flat networks? Well, uh, the answer is yes, but uh, essentially you need to find, you can fine tune something else. Uh, namely, you can fine tune the uh, interaction. This is, a, this is an example of what I mean, because if you take the same system uh, that we just discussed, uh, take the Hubbard interaction up here, Hubbard interaction down here, and this additional term, which is basically a density-density interaction term that uh, makes two particle interactions between these two neighboring sites. So the interaction span over this uh, uh, red color uh, rectangle. Uh, essentially, you see that this uh, interaction is essentially a product of density terms. 
And uh, once you do the transformation to this detangled picture, uh, the good thing about this interaction is that it stays itself. So no matter what interact, uh, what the rotation you do, this interaction remains itself from either here, this representation or that representation. So basically here you end up with, a, with an interaction that is just a product of density terms. So you don't have these terms that are going to allow particle to jump from these connected sites. And therefore there is no particle uh, there is no charge transport in the system. Now I'm running out of time, so I'm speeding up a little bit. But uh, I wanted to say that essentially, if this interaction doesn't look like very physical, because uh, you say, what, what the heck is this uh, inter density density interaction? Well, there are various examples. And this is also where Alexei kick in, uh, because Alexei is a master of engineering uh, and fine tuning diverse terms. Uh, and for instance, another one uh, that also appeared in this paper by Kuno is that you can look at an interaction, for instance, of, that applies uh, where here it was studied for spill and spermions, which is uh, this one, again, product of densities, which uh, now follows the profile of this uh, cross pattern uh, network. And if you do the detangling rotation is again, uh, remain itself. So it is invariant under this transformation and therefore Again, no particle transport. There is no jump of particle between neighboring dimers and therefore again kills a completely um, charge transport. Now this thing, this very visual uh, representation can be exported in uh, more complex uh, networks. Uh, you can go in higher dimension. Uh, you don't have to stick with specific uh, many body statistics. So you can, uh, you can do it for bosons, fillers, fermions and whatever else. And uh, among the various properties uh, that we focused on, and this is uh, where I conclude my talk, is, uh, well, now we engineered, we fine tuned a system that completely kills uh, charge transport, but then we, we were uh, left with what happens with the heat exchange. And this is uh, basically, this was the object of uh, Igor's talk, because, uh, and the upshot is that uh, in 1D, uh, you need the system to be fully populated because as soon as one dimer is empty, then the, then the system is disconnected in half. And uh, so you need this channel, this conducting channel. So you need the states where each single dimer is populated. And uh, if you check the number of this conducting state uh, with respect to the, all the non-conducting state uh, over the, the system size, so over the number of unit cell, the number, the, the ratio of these two numbers decrease exponentially. But if you go to higher dimension, you essentially end up with a percolation problem. So with this, I basically conclude my talk uh, with uh, the take home messages, which, uh, well, the, this first uh, is something that probably everyone was already familiar, but uh, something yet to keep in mind. So flatman lattices existing parametric families they sort of, and then within these parametric families, you can find the parametric subfamilies. So you can have hierarchies of fine tuning and uh, you can use this fine tuning to sort of uh, come up with certain networks that tame the perturbation. For instance, in our case, the interaction. So uh, that uh, retain exact caging uh, with nonlinearity that has some, uh, some of this funny many body interaction dependent compact localized state with our interaction or even uh, that uh, you can completely kill particle transport. Now, among these, most of, the, most of them will be uh, more relevant say mathematically and less physically. And then if you dig harder and harder, you can come up with system that can have some uh, experimental application, maybe, but uh, that uh, we have to see. And with that, I thank you with your, for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very uh, interesting talk. And uh, this session is open for question. Okay, so uh, first question from uh, Christian, please. Yeah, um, hi, Carlo. Uh, thanks hey, for the wonderful talk <laughs> and nice to see you again. Nice to see um, you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, first of all, if I got it right, is when you perform these abstract, let's say, unitary transformation, local unitary transformations, uh, what you end up with is indeed then again the real space lattice, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so it's another 
lattice in real space if you want to implement it. And for the first thing is even uh, for, non, for the non-interacting case, I suppose you end up with hopping parameters which are in general complex and at least negative, right? And then even more cumbersome, let's say in the interacting case. So touching upon the question by Professor Haroni, um, is there, an, which you partially answered, do you see ways to find sensible realizations of this, like uh, fine tuning, as you say, the, the interaction? Uh, is that's the open question, right? Uh, well, uh, the way to, uh, to, to achieve uh, the, the lattice themselves, uh, basically, we already had some answer from the already known cases. Uh, for instance, uh, this uh, rhombic lattice of the Kreuz yeah. or the dice in, uh, in higher dimension. Uh, but also adding interactions yeah. then. Yes. That's my main concern. Yes. Because you show these uh, red lines, right? And I have, I have, yeah, have a hard time imagining how one can, you know, uh, well, uh, well, collectively well, what, what you What you will uh, realize experimentally is something that looks like that. This has been uh, realized, uh, well, at least uh, the non-interacting right. case. And then, okay. uh, uh, and then this is essentially a set of... Uh, Spin interaction. Now, uh, if you yeah. if you look at for uh, for spinless fermions and then uh, through Jordan Wigner, you recast this thing, okay, into that Z interaction, and uh, the interaction essentially follows the same uh, the same pattern of All right. the of the of the single particle hopping. Right. So that, so that's uh, concrete that hope I guess, that it might I mean, actually... I cannot say that this is uh, realizable <laughs> because yeah. I don't think it has. Yet. Okay. Hope it but will. it's a promising direction, at least, to, uh, uh, to be able to think Well, about. that's what uh, we, we, and not only we, not only okay. we hope. Very nice. And, and then a second comment that's so, in the end, one would actually be able to prevent thermalization uh, in, a, in a many body system, like by having these. So, if particles statistically, let's say, happen to, uh, you know, come onto uh, neighboring sites, as you showed, and this mm -hmm. condition for blocking transport is fulfilled, mm -hmm. then they will just uh, stay stuck there, right? That's yes, a, uh, yeah. so they, they are free. So imagine that you have uh, now a finite density of particle either in this representation or in this representation, if it comes more handy to visualize it. So you will have a certain number of say, uh, so if you take like spinless fermion, you can just have like nothing, one or two. And if you have two, basically nothing is happened. So you can have like either zero or one particle. Or if you have bosons, with uh, the above, uh, this other interaction, which perhaps is less physical, I don't know, but uh, right. you can have. And, but I mean, uh, so they can interact, but and they can move uh, freely inside here, but yes. uh, they are just simply not gonna jump. They're gonna exchange energy, and this was the, the question of this talk, mm -hmm. uh, okay, of this result, and yesterday's talk by Igor, uh, but. Uh, yeah. What I mean is you don't need to prepare it in such a funny eigenstate or, or a Fox state uh, in particular. So, no, not in this case. Uh, well, yeah. Perhaps in the other case where uh, you were uh, uh, here, where yeah. basically with the Hubbard, you know, here you ignite about a, a diverse type of state, like some extended that gives you some ballistic propagation, some other ones that uh, give you this uh, strong localization. Uh, so here you probably have to uh, uh, sort of prepare your initial states in the dynamic uh, at some specific uh, initial right. condition. While here, you, you don't really. <laughs> right. Yeah, but if one adds things right and left, sorry to insist, uh, then yeah. the, the rest of the states in the state space would, uh, you know, uh, disappear by, by loss, let's say, and mm -hmm. those would stay there in a sense, uh, mm -hmm. if you have a sink. Okay, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other question? I, I think uh, due to time limit, maybe one more question. And uh, we already had uh, quite many questions during this talk or so. Okay, allow me to add, uh, yeah, Dario, sorry for not being able to answer you and uh, let's talk after your talk. No, but <laughs> actually, actually, I believe, I believe that uh, with, the, with the rest of the talk, you answer it because, oh, I mean, really? initially I was naively, but, and initially I, I was naively thinking, oh, maybe the fact that uh, even in presence of interaction, you don't have transport means that, let's say, this is a fake interaction and by some unitary transformation, you can go again to the detangled situation. 
But the fact that instead with two particles you have transported means that no, I mean, is is another kind of effect. That was essentially the question. So yeah, I think that all counts very somehow. Okay. Yeah. But still, if Thanks. you want to see more in detail of all these better of terms, so you're welcome anytime. But okay. Okay. Sh sharing Thank my you. screen. Or well, of course you have Alexei for that because. <laughs> ah yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think. Uh... If there is no more question, uh, let's thank the speaker again.